We're beginning this session with a big question. How can life-saving global health innovations make the journey from discovery to development to delivery? Today, I'm joined by two experts to discuss this question, providing specific examples of how partnerships between social entrepreneurs and the US government and other governments can take global health solutions to scale. Krista Donaldson is CEO at Equalize Health, a nonprofit medical technology company based in New Delhi, formerly known as DREV. This is a social enterprise with a new name as well as an expanded mission of helping other innovators move away from lab-driven innovation and toward innovations that are designed with user and market constraints in mind. And Amy Lin, who's acting director of the Center for Innovation and Impact at USAID. She was previously based in India, where Equalize Health also works, developing social enterprise models to meet needs in low resource settings, such as clean drinking water and slums. And prior to this role, she served in roles at the Clinton Health Access Initiative, the World Bank and TechnoServe. And I'm really excited to talk with both Krista and Amy about, as we often say at Prescription for Progress, what works, what doesn't, and what's next when it comes to partnerships between social innovators and the US government. Um, I'm gonna start with a few questions for Krista and then we'll uh, learn a little bit more about Amy and her work and then we'll dive into conversation, the three of us. So Krista, I mentioned earlier uh, that DREV rebranded to Equalize Health, but it's about much more than a new name. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, I would love to. Um, it had been a longer process. I know like we see it at the end when the name changes, but we had a really important milestone that we hit last year, which was a million patients treated with our products. And while we were really excited about that, at the same time, the product development process, what you talked about from discovery all the way to scaling and sustainable scaling was just too slow. Um, it was too slow for the needs that we saw and what we knew our sector was capable in terms of technology and product development, and really great user research and fundamentally partnerships. And just to give you an example of this, we were doing due diligence around our phototherapy device for neonatal jaundice in a Rwandan hospital. They were using our phototherapy device and a pediatrician, there were no neonatologists there. And the pediatrician who was taking care of the babies said to my colleague, he goes, oh, can you develop CPAP? And she said, um, well, right now we're focused on this, but you know, tell me, tell me, how are you treating the babies now? And he said, I'm only praying for them because he didn't have access to CPAP, even though the technology itself has been around for 50 years. And for me, this really talks about not just the challenges of organizations like us doing the development, but the overall sector in being able to respond to critical needs like that. Thanks, Krista. And I know that uh, you've worked with USAID um, in your journey at Equalize Health. For example, you were part of Saving Lives at Birth, which provided seed funds, validation funds, and transition to scale funds as well as non-financial support for innovations in maternal and newborn health. So I wonder if you can talk about what partnerships have been the most meaningful in helping you scale the solutions your team's worked on. And um, specifically when it comes to USAID, what have some of the unique opportunities and challenges been? Yeah, so there's a lot of questions in there. I'll start with uh, USAID and the partnership. So we did, we received Saving Lives at Birth um, grant. We applied actually nine times and got one. <laughs> But um, it was in, it was incredibly invaluable in the sense that we had the credibility of USAID behind us. We had access to the network of innovators, and I think you know putting on the hat of the larger sector, it was a, saving lives of birth was a huge service in creating a whole body of innovators. And with the Equalize Health model, um, what we're doing as compared to doing the discovery through product development is we are identifying innovators who have promising solutions already to like well-known needs or needs that come up through our user research, again, driven by like healthcare workers. And so that enables a way to speed up the development process. Um, USAID also brought in a lot of commercial actors, which is great too, because on the end, you also, if you wanna be able to scale quickly, you wanna have good distribution um, quickly, you wanna work with a commercial partner as well. And that's also part of our updated Equalize Health model. And just to understand how USAID fits into a broader context of partnerships that have been meaningful for you, I guess, um, why why has that been so useful to have a government partner, since we're talking about how to scale up more of these government partnerships? What's the unique added value um, in the context of the broader context of partnerships that have really helped you go to scale? Well, in our case too, it's it's a special, it's a it's a credibility, right? And it's this network that we have, we and others have access to to be able to develop partnerships, whether they're commercial partnerships for distribution or scaling, or it's partnerships around innovation. 
And just to give you an example, we have a partnership with an innovator in South Africa. He's an OB gynecologist, and he had several ideas about postpartum hemorrhage. And I think Saving Lives at Birth and USAID in their work has really created an ecosystem now to have so much capacity that we all can be de you know, developing innovations and making sure the good ones get to scale and solve the problems. Thanks, Krista. And uh, in preparation for this conversation, I pulled actually a line from a story I wrote a while back uh, that included Equalize Health. And you had mentioned the expertise needed to develop innovations is not the same expertise needed to get the technology into the hands of nurses, doctors, and patients. So partnerships are really key there. I want to go ahead and bring Amy into this. And Amy, I have a few questions for you so that people get to better know uh, the Center for Innovation and Impact, and then we'll, we'll all three come back together. But Amy, I know that CII's mission statement is all about incubating new ideas, putting them into practice, and scaling them through partnership. Uh, but concretely, what does this look like? What are some examples of that? Thank you, Catherine, and happy to, um, to share some of the ways that we try to live that mission statement. I think one example of where we've tried to put an approach into practice and using partnership is with the Open Doors uh, Africa Private Healthcare Initiative. And this is a partnership with the President's Malaria Initiative with our uh, fellow US agency, the Development Finance Corporation and the Health Finance Coalition to bring together a $35 million working capital fund to help keep private clinics in five different countries in Sub-Saharan Africa open. And I think it just shows the power of how different types of actors coming together with their different resources can make an outsized impact. Um, there was a small amount of grant funding from USAID and enabled a loan guarantee uh, from the Development Finance Corporation, which then enabled the full $35 million of working capital to these private clinics that otherwise would have had to close their doors and not serve patients who relied on them during the epidemic. I think another example, just to quickly show the breadth of what this can mean, is related to some of the human-centered design work we've done. I think a lot of times when people think of an innovation, they think of a thing, some new shiny object that will hopefully transform lives. And in many cases it can, but it doesn't get there by itself. And we need to think about the delivery of that, that new innovation. And so when we were looking at uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV or a pill that you would take every day to prevent HIV infection, we tried to work with our HIV colleagues to consider what is going to be important to the young women that this could most help. The young women who do not want to think about a stigmatized lifelong disease who don't wanna take a pill every day and associate themselves with sickness. And so we worked with um, human-centered design partners and many communities um, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa to think about how to position it instead of a medicine, more as a beauty product and part of a daily beauty regimen. And so that included a pill case that looks like a lip balm case. It includes branding that's empowering and vibrant. And it includes um, messaging and tools for the healthcare providers who can better message this to young women and adolescent girls so that it's something they want to take, not just something they feel they need to take. Those are great examples. And in a moment, I wanna bring Krista back into this. I know that she would agree with your point that innovation isn't always a thing. Um, and that design is really wow. critical. We can talk about that in a moment. But um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more, Amy, about speaking of evolution, we talked about the evolution from DREV to Equalize Health. The Center for Innovation and Impact has also experienced an evolution. You now, you now have projects focused on market access and digital health. So can you just quickly talk through what are the learnings that have informed that evolution? One of the most important is that you need the broader ecosystem to evolve and support an innovation to get it to scale. And so you might have a new product, but you have to think about what channels you can use to get it to low resource settings. You need to consider the financing that might need a new business model to enable procurers or end users or um, public sector financers to afford that innovation. And I think to what Krista mentioned earlier, the broader ecosystem, how can we build capabilities so that other innovators, whether they're directly funded by USAID or not, also have um, a fighting chance to get started and bring their, um, bring their offerings to a wider network and, and to really reach those who are most in need. So it's that broader ecosystem that's really encouraged us to think about that market access, that financing, the market shaping and the digital health uh, broader um, 
broader landscape uh, to fit into where the global health um, world is today. Uh, whereas before, I think we were much more focused on sourcing new ideas. And now we're doing both that sourcing and supporting, but also bringing it to, uh, to usage. Great. Thanks for that. And one more question for you before I bring Krista back would be to build on a theme we've talked about a lot today. Uh, yes, responding to COVID-19 and this crisis at hand, but also maintaining progress on other global health priorities that have been hugely disrupted uh, by the COVID pandemic. So I wonder how the center has tried to strike that balance and prioritize. I think one thing to uh, paraphrase Rahm Emanuel is to never let a crisis go to waste. And for all of the horrible um, consequences of COVID-19, it has also opened up new opportunities to use uh, digital health tools, um, telemedicine, to partner with the private sector in new ways. And I think as we not only hope that those lead to immediate and medium-term benefits in the COVID response, we can also see partnerships are so crucial. And one of the ways that we have partnered with, um, a, we have been partnering with Coca-Cola and other partners in the Project Last Mile partnership. That has been instrumental in making sure that supply chains are able and ready to deliver COVID vaccines and that strategic marketing can be used to generate demand for those vaccines when they get there. But that uh, stronger supply chain and that sharpened um, outreach doesn't have to be limited to only the COVID response. So how can we take that foundation and extend it for other health needs as we go forward? Thanks, Amy. So Krista, I want to bring you back into this. Uh, let's build on Amy's point that innovation isn't always a thing. Um, and, and let's look toward the future because, um, you know, I've, I've heard similar points being made before, right? That we're often so focused on, um, you know, a gadget or, you know, a mobile app or what have you. Um, but innovation needs to be thought of much more broadly than that. Yeah. Uh, and I know both of you have thought about this in terms of the role of design, for example. So, uh, we're talking now about this journey from uh, discovery to development to delivery. Where do we go from here and what role does design play in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's the fact that we're even talking about design and development and global health is so fantastic because 10 years we weren't. And, uh, you know, to your point, like, yes, it's absolutely about the environment too. Like, are you designing for the environment for a solution, whether it's hardware or service to come into? And, um, and this is an ongoing challenge and uh, colleagues and I, as part of a special issue of global health science and practice, looked at the future of design and global health. And um, a few things that came out of that, I'll just mention really quickly, is one is like incentive, incentive, incentive. Are they aligned? You have these partnerships, but um, like a social enterprise needs to be aligned with the commercial actor who's distributing the product. And those have to be matched up very quickly. And right now, a lot of our financial model is based on a continuously unwell population in the for-profit area. Um, the second point is like design itself needs to evolve in global health. We've been very focused on users, which is great, but we also need to think about life center design, thinking about planetary health and some of the other impacts, especially as we know the climate, the, you know, climate change's impact on particularly women and children. And then lastly, organizations, whether they're USAID or Equalized Health, we need to be able to reckon with our values and where we think the future is going. The pandemic was predictable, although in many cases we treat it like it was a wild card moment. And um, futurists say that if you think about the future, you can actually shape it because you're more prepared for it. And I, I think I would just, Go ahead, Amy. just two other points. I agree with all of that, that centrality of the users. I would also say picking up on Krista's last point about climate change, there are lots of new types of data and consequences that are happening outside of what we traditionally call global health data. How can we think about climate change uh, predictions and, and data? How can we think about urbanization and migration movements and demographic changes and take into account all of those as we make our global health programming decisions? I think increasingly, if we bridge the silos between these sectors, the more informed and prepared we can be. And I would just add one other quick plug is, mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of talk today about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think that's so important. And the more that we can be listening and co-creating with the communities, whether it's through a human-centered design approach or other techniques, is gonna be really crucial to making sure that we're really uh, responding to what they would prioritize in terms of um, thinking about new innovations. Thanks, Amy. And I know, you know, Equalize Health has worked with USAID. I'm putting myself in the shoes of many innovators joining Prescription for Progress from around the world 
who maybe haven't found a way to partner with USAID or um, I know Krista, you mentioned applying many times for saving lives at birth. Was it nine times? Nine. Uh, nine I'm times. Nine. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they've tried, you know, eight times and they haven't yeah. hit that ninth time. That's a success yet. And so my question is, you know, how we've heard a little bit about how Equalize Health and USAID have worked together. Why is it so important to see more of these kinds of partnerships between USAID, or I should note bilateral donors broadly, and social entrepreneurs. And and since this event is all about partnerships, what are the kinds of organizations, initiatives, or conversations that we need to help make more of that happen? Yeah, and I would say it, the partnerships need to be much more than USAID, who you know is a big elephant, a big smart elephant in the room. So it gives us access. And then there's the social enterprises. There's innovators, and you know, to the point earlier, there's lots of great ideas out there, but there isn't a ton of solution or a ton of organizations that you know, for medical devices particularly, are capable of managing the quality management system for regulatory approval and all the like later stage stuff that goes in and bringing really promising context to market and to impact. And so USAID, again, can play like such an incredible role as a convener, bringing together innovators, bringing together commercial actors, bringing together um, social enterprises who are well positioned to connect and operationalize you know, great ideas getting to the markets and people who need them. And I definitely take that elephant metaphor. I appreciate it. There are strengths that an elephant offers and there are weaknesses. Nobody can do it alone. And the partnerships allow us to match with the mighty mice who might be fleeter or um, more nimble or coming up with new ideas. And I think together we have to find ways to complement our strengths and mitigate our weaknesses together through partnership. Thanks, Amy. And earlier, something that came up was this broader ecosystem needed to get solutions to scale. So I want to bring in a perspective from our audience. And I think um, Team Fund is, is one example of that broader ecosystem. So Yusuf Mazar is managing partner at Team Fund, which is an impact venture fund focused on investing in healthcare technologies, addressing unmet medical needs globally. And Yusuf, I'd love to hear your reactions to this conversation, as well as any questions you might want to pose to Krista or Amy. Sure. No, thanks for adding me to the, to the conversation. Um, I think, again, in the spirit of of uh, partnership and collaboration, which is the theme here. Uh, you know, I heard both Amy and Krista mention over and over again about kind of the e ecosystem and the different actors that really need to play together. And as an impact venture group, you know, we all have, we have a similar mission that USAID and, and Equalize Health has. Um, and I'd love to hear from both of them how groups like ours and us specifically, wh whether it's with our portfolio companies or ways to integrate with incubation uh, through USAID, or to have our companies work with uh, uh, with Equalize in a in a different way. But how can we, as venture investors, work with these two ends of the uh, continuum um, and and partner with you guys better? Yusuf, it's an excellent question, and I really see it as part of the ecosystem, as you noted, and also a bit of a handoff. In some ways, it's a relay race and different actors um, can hold the baton at different times um, to help move innovations um, from their different stages. And so sometimes grant capital will be catalytic to help a new innovator get started. Um, other times it might be a bit of a bridge funding with concessionary capital that can help transition it to more uh, of a sustainable business model if that's the route that they're taking. And then eventually maybe they might grow to be eligible to be invested in uh, by an impact venture fund like Team Fund in yourself. Um, so I think we need all of these different types of capital and supports in order to bring innovations, um, help them get started and then get them all the way to scale. Yeah, I agree with Amy. I think the one thing I would add is that we're all in the same ecosystem. And so the more we can collaborate, um, you know, like, for example, we do what we call downstream innovation. Again, I don't like separating upstream and downstream because you need to be designing for downstream from the very beginning. But we're all developing different aspects. And, um, you know, success with team fund portfolio organizations actually supports us because we have some, many of the similar goals. And so at the very least, um, you know, there is a need to, for, to be bringing everyone together. Yusuf, thanks for that great question. I feel like it's the model of what we look for in Prescription for Progress, that you've listened to examples of partnerships, and then you've kind of asked, well, how do I plug in or how can I contribute? Um, so I really appreciate that. 
So to close out the day, I just want to thank Amy, Krista, Yusuf for your time. Uh, this has been a really fascinating conversation to be continued. And I hope that our attendees like Yusuf are wondering, where do I fit into this mix of a better future for global health and that journey from discovery to development to delivery and, and form those connections so you can continue the conversation beyond today's event. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.